Welcome to the November program of the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch World War II History Roundtable. And tonight we designate as the Dr. Harold C. Deutsch Lecture. Again, thank you so much for, uh, for attending. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the programs that we were going to uh, have earlier, Ernest Wertheim was a German Jew, uh, lived uh, as, as a young man in Germany. Uh, they had a, the family had a large department store. We know Dayton's Wertheim in, in Berlin. Uh, he, uh, his family, some of his family escaped. He came, became part of the army. Uh, we were going to have him as a speaker. He was gracious enough to send copies of the books that Axel talked about, and he produced this video that we wanted to show. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry I was unable to give my lecture on September 8th in person. I hope the next few minutes will give you a little information about my life of 96 years. My family lived in Berlin for several generations. I was born in Berlin and I grew up in Hamburg until spring of 1934. My grandparents on my mother's side lived in an apartment house that was built in 1865, confiscated by the Nazis and destroyed by bombs during the war. After my grandfather died, my mother moved to Berlin to be with my grandmother. My grandmother's sister, Martha Mendelssohn, married Wilhelm Wertheim one of the owners of the famous Wertheim department store in Berlin and several other cities. My immediate family often traveled by train from Hamburg and visited my mother's family as well as other family members. I spent a lot of time with my grand-aunt Martha Wertheim. Aunt Martha and her husband Wilhelm lived in a beautiful villa with 45 rooms with extensive gardening. One of the rooms was my room. I often visited my uncle in his large office in the department store and watched from the window Hitler's Kanzlei being built. I saw all the concrete being poured into the cellar that became famous during the last days of Hitler. On January 30th, 1933, Hitler came to power, and this is when my father was kidnapped by the Nazis. My mother was ad advised by my father's employer, the Duke of Croy, that something had happened to my dad, and that he advised us to disappear and not leave any trace of where we were going. My, my mother then said to me, Ernest, you are in charge of the family now. I was 13 years old. My father was in bad shape when he returned home. This is when I decided I wanted to leave Germany, immigrate to the United States. At that time, everybody who was immigrating to the United States became rich overnight. That was the thinking of people who didn't go. I was advised that I needed a profession so that I could support myself in the United States. My father managed to get me into a horticultural college at the age of 14. I graduated with honors three years later. In the summer of 1933, my father left for Belgium and France, where he worked several years for the Duke. That is part of history. The Duke uh, had quite a num number of forests that by the Treaty of Versailles were given to the Belgium of France. But the regulation stated that the owners of that property would be reimbursed. And my father worked on that for the Duke when he left Germany. When he returned to Berlin, 
which I never understood. He was arrested and placed into a Sachsenhausen concentration camp. I did rescue my father by going into the con concentration camp, which is a harrowing story as is. It took me 18 months to get a visa to go to the United States and get the exit papers from Germany. I was at my grandfather's home when when the doorbell rang at about 8 p.m. on November 9th, 1938. It was a crystal night, the famous crystal night. My dad told me as the bell rang, get out, please disappear, in a very rough and very strict voice. This was the last time I saw my dad or the last time I talked to him. The Gestapo arrested him that evening. During this evening, I saw Nazis herding groups of Jewish people down the street. I saw bodies hanging upside down from lampposts. I was saw cars driving over people. I saw shops being broken into. I saw beautiful, a beautiful temple fire on fire and other things I do not wish to remember. When I left Germany with all the correct papers, that I was, I was held up at the Dutch-German border. I almost lost my life at this point. The book covers my life in the United States from 1939 to December 7th in Pearl Harbor. During this period, I tried hard to get a visa for my mother. I did not succeed, and both my mother and grandmother was deported to the concentration camp Theresienstadt, and both of them died there. Shortly after Pearl Harbor, I was inducted in the U.S. Army as an enemy alien. On June 7, 1942, I became an American citizen, and on Friday, one week later, the 13th of June, I married Margaret, though so she married an American citizen, even though she was German. In 1943, I became an officer in the U.S. Army. I served in New Guinea and the Philippines, and I was very fortunate to having met John MacArthur on several occasions. There are several exciting war stories that, that the book covers. The last part of my book covers my civilian life from 1946 to 2015. This includes my work as a landscape architect, my partnership with the two architect partners, my activities with the California Horticultural Society, where I was president for four years, my service on the board of directors of the American Society of Landscape Architects, my service on the Bear Creek Planning Committee for 27 years, our house in Alpine Meadows, our work nationally and internationally on garden center design and lectures that I gave both in the United States and Europe as well as South Africa and Australia. I did receive many national and international awards. The award was we liked the very best was my lifetime season pass for the Alpine Meadows ski lift. We have been happily ma been married for 74 years, I suggest you read my book. Thank you for listening. I want to thank Dale Bachman of Bachman's Nursery for uh, reaching out. And Dale, are you still here somewhere? Dale, thank you so much. And, and give a good report to Ernest. Uh, since this is a Nuremberg topic and uh, uh, Harold Deutsch, as you know, the Harold Deutsch lecture, uh, Harold was at the Nuremberg trials and uh, interrogated the uh, Germans that were there. Uh, Connie Harris has done extensive research on this and is going to talk about Harold Deutsch's involvement at Nuremberg. Um, Dr. Harold Deutsch, as some of you know, uh, by the way, how many of you were Harold Deutsch's students at the University of Minnesota? So yes, we have many of you here. Good, 
um, was not only a popular professor at Minnesota, but during the war was a member of the Research and Analysis Division of the OSS. And at the end of the war, he was loaned out uh, to the State Department to interrogate the German leaders at Nuremberg. I say that uh, he still collected his paycheck from the Office of Strategic Services, but he was part of the State Department Special Interrogations mission. Deutsch was uniquely qualified for this uh, since he was fluent in German and conducted his interviews of the German leaders um, in that language. And during his sabbatical years in uh, 1936 and 1938, um, he traveled throughout Germany and talked to uh, many people and other leaders. I mentioned this uh, last month when, for those of you who were here. Uh, the people he interviewed are well known in the annals of history. Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, who was chief of the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht, or the German General Staff, from February 1938 to the war's end. Colonel General Alfred Jodl, the chief of the OKW's Operation Offices and Operations Staff from 1939 to 1945. In addition, uh, Deutsch interviewed staff officers, um, General of Artillery, Artillery Walter Warlemont, who served, served as Yodel's Deputy Chief of Operations from August 1935 to September 1944. General George Thomas, uh, former Chief of the War Economy Office until January 1943. Um, he was also somewhat involved in the conspiracy against Hitler. And unlike um, these other staff officers, he also interviewed Colonel General Heinz Guderian, who was known as a, the fighting general and is considered the innovator of tank warfare. The, inter the interviews Deutsch conducted, and he liked to call them interviews instead of interrogations, were conducted in various places, uh, locations like Ober the Nuremberg Courthouse, and also Falkenstein Hospital. That's where he um, interviewed uh, General Thomas. The special interrogations team had set up sorts, these rules for the conduct of the uh, members of their team. The interrogators were not allowed to call prisoners by their titles, such as field marshal or general. An interrogator was prohibited from shaking a prisoner's hand. And no favors could be done for prisoners, such as providing them with cigarettes, chocolates, or delivering letters to relatives. Um, the, while the rules were not um, strictly enforced, um, they were considered, you know, you were expected to follow them, but Deutsch proceeded to break every one of them. <laughs> um, according to Deutsch, these rules set up the prisoners for the perfect interview. Most American interrogators were very gruff and condescending, and they had no understanding of the German mindset with its attention to titles and formalities. Deutsch approached these men with this in mind. He did not browbeat them as a lawyer would do. No disrespect to Greg. Um, instead, he was just a historian, just interested in their wartime experiences. His manner made them more willing to speak to him. His focus during his interviews uh, were on, was on German foreign policy, and he did not present himself as a member of the prosecution, but just as an historian interested in getting the facts straight, which made them less hesitant to speak, you know, to speak with him. And again, his fluency in German, and of course his last name, um, did not hurt either. I'm just going to talk about one of the interviews that he did, a short excerpt of some larger research I've done, um, was his visit with um, Alfred Jodl and Wilhelm Keitel. Uh, he met with them together in October of 1945 so they could corroborate each other's stories. And although Jodl was a, to quote um, Dr. Deutsch, a man of great dignity, uh, Keitel retained his title as bootlicker supreme. Deutsch's <laughs> words, again, not mine. Uh, during the interview, Jodl sat ramrod straight in a chair as Keitel laid casually on his stomach on a nearby bunk. When the interview was concluded, Keitel fawned over Deutsch, saying, always at your service, always at your service. 
Deutsch uh, questioned Jodl several ma on, about several matters having to do with Hitler's foreign policy, especially regarding relations between the Foreign Office and the OKW. Jodl felt that there was no real obvious points of friction since Hitler believed in the strict separation between these two offices. In addition, Hitler insisted that any major problems would go through him, so there would be very little difficulty. Most questions that developed were in the form of prestige questions, because Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop asserted that army commanders were part of the foreign office in occupied areas, and von Ribbentrop had to be reined in often by Hitler in this manner, on this matter. Keitel was questioned about military matters, but the interesting aspect of his interrogation was his ex explanation of the 1938 Blomberg Fritsch case. Keitel had intimate knowledge of both of these cases because von Blomberg's son was married to Keitel's daughter, and von Fritsch was a longtime comrade. At first, Keitel was reluctant to discuss the matter, but Deutsch informed him that he knew the basic facts of the cases because of his 1938 travels in Germany. I'm going to go into a little bit of background of what this is. Uh, Field Marshal Werner von Blomberg, the Minister of War, made a mistake that cost him his high position. He fell in love. Von, yeah, you're going to get a little romance here tonight at the room. <laughs> von Blomberg wished to marry a young woman, and Eisk asked Keitel for an opinion. Keitel asserted that the army would not object. After the marriage, which Keitel did not attend, was discovered that von Blomberg's young bride had something of a past, meaning that she was a suspected prostitute, which was never proven, but she was a pornographic model. When this was reported to Hitler, von Blomberg was forced to resign. In the case of Colonel General Baron Werner von Fritsch, the commander-in-chief of the army, he was accused of an offense under Article 175 of the Reich Penal Code. He was accused of being a homosexual. There was no such thing as, you know, like we have today. Don't ask, don't tell. You don't tell. Hitler asked Keitel, who replaced von Blomberg, what should be done in this case. Keitel told Hitler that Fritsch was confronted with the accusation immediately and had to have the opportunity to defend himself. Although Fritsch denied the accu accusation, he was removed from his position, disgraced, and Fritsch died on the Eastern Front late in the war. There's a full explanation of this in, in Deutsch's book, Hitler and His Generals. Um, Fritsch was confused with a captain, uh, Fritsch, who was a homosexual, uh, but Himmler and Heydrich uh, colluded to getting rid of von Fritsch so they could have more power with Hitler. As I, as I just said, the removal of Bloom, von Bloomberg and von Fritsch gave Hitler the opportunity to, to consolidate his hold over the armed forces, replacing these men with Keitel and First General Walter von Brautich, who did, who did not have the courage to confront Hitler. Um, neither one of them did. In addition, after seeing what happened to their comrades, um, many generals feared the same fate. Both Jodl and Keitel were executed for their part in the war. They might be mentioned when Greg gets up here. After the war, Deutsch used these interviews and many others, uh, and they provided a part of his narrative for his major works, The Conspiracy Against Hitler in the Twilight War and Hitler and His Generals. I think um, they're, still very, they're still considered classics today, um, and are, there are copies still around. I think we have some. Here. In addition, um, many of his interviews and uh, his interviews with other German generals who survived the war became part of his classroom lectures at the University of Minnesota and the Army War College, and of course, parts of this round table. Now, Don asked me to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, this is our t tonight's main speaker is Greg Peterson, founder of the Robert Jackson Institute. He is a, a lawyer. Um, and he will be discussing the Nuremberg trial and its recent commemoration. I'm thrilled. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harris, for the introduction. 
to Colonel Patton, uh, to, to Mrs. Deutsches. Mrs. Deutscher, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we, we talked back in 2007, and I have uh, copies of the files, and they became part of my research and part of what we have at the Robert Jackson Center. Uh, I'm here to talk about the Nuremberg trial and its legacy. Um, I, I wonderfully en enjoyed the presentation by uh, Mr. Mr. Wertheim, and what I what's important to note is the Nuremberg trial was in fact the bookend of World War II. You started in you know 1939. Of course, there was that all that buildup, or much of which was discussed in that presentation. But really, the war starts in 1939, and it then obviously there's VE Day, then there's VJ Day, but ultimately there had to be some sort of closure to the war. And it is question, as was uh, wonderfully Dr. Harris laid out in the round table ta tablet, um, whether or not there would in fact be one. It wasn't so clear. It wasn't so clear whether there would be and in fact that the uh, Moscow Declaration where there was a, a meeting and the big three met, there was a determination they should try the war criminals. This is back in 1943. But that's all he really said. It was kind of a sentence or two. And then it got to the Yalta, and they discussed that again, that there ought to be some form of accountability. And then towards the end of the war, as I was kind of wrapping up the conversation, which was mentioned earlier about uh, the, the Russians and the British were just tired and whether or not the accountability would take the form of execution. Let's just find the top 50,000 Nazis, execute them. That's our justice, that's retribution, and call it a day. Uh, President Roosevelt thought differently, but that wasn't a unanimous even a feeling within the United States. Some of his advisors thought there ought to be not be a trial, some thought there should be. The backdrop of all of that is the fact that, uh, let me just stop. I stop for a second because I want to paint a picture. I want to paint a picture because this will all come to uh, finality, hopefully, at the end. Three weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was in Nuremberg. I was a guest of the city of Nuremberg, and they were commemorating the 70th anniversary of the Nuremberg trial. And there was the Lord Mayor of the city of Nuremberg. Here we are in 2016, welcoming the international community, welcoming the Robert Jackson Center representing that, welcoming representatives of Britain and, and France there, uh, talking about Nuremberg and being a center for international human law. When in fact in the 1934, 35, 36, that same titled Lord Mayor would be there welcoming at the Zeppelin Field Adolf Hitler and the annual Nazi conventions. You've seen the newsreels, you've seen the Klieg lights, you've seen all of that. And by the way, that stadium is still there and you can in fact uh, have the experience, for better or worse, to go there and to enjoy that. So he's back in 2016, a few weeks ago, the Lord Mayor's welcoming us. At the same time, uh, Don Ferenc is there to talk on behalf of his dad, who is the last surviving Nuremberg prosecutor, Ben Ferenc. Ben was the chief prosecutor and for the Eitzengruppen subsequent Nuremberg trial. So Don gave this wonderful speech. The Attorney General for the United States, Loretta Lynch, flew over there on behalf of the United States to talk about the importance of the Nuremberg trial and the rule of law. At the same time, shortly after she finished, Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Fatu Bensouda, spoke about the legacy of Nuremberg and how it's found form in the International Criminal Court today. And then he concluded by having a poem that was written called and, and presented by the called The Shadow of Nuremberg. And again, its legacy today. While there, I also had the chance to interview two German historians. 
two German historians on the subject of what's it mean, what was the legacy of the Nuremberg trial to the German people. I interviewed them separately and they had the same basic answer, was that the Nuremberg trial was that moment in time where in fact the evidence could be presented on the perpetrators of World War II, the leaders of the Third Reich, and those were the individuals, not the German people, these are the individuals who in fact had implemented the uh, policies of Adolf Hitler, and from that trial came convictions, from that trial came evidence, which then in turn was the expiation of the sins of the Third Reich, which then planted the seeds for democracy in Germany. During that time period, Charlie and, and, and uh, Mr. Christensen, who I'll introduce in just a second, can remember that Conrad Adenauer and the German chancellor uh, in the early 1950s really wanted to take the democracy that had been played out within the German part, and it turned into what we now know one of the strongest uh, nations in Europe. They also went on to say that the architect, the architect of the trial at Nuremberg was a guy named Robert H. Jackson. Robert H. Jackson, who we have a center named after him, and you might say, why? And Robert Jackson was, to the Germans, the architect of the trial, the trial of which created the evidence and the uh, proof of the banalities of the Third Reich and the evils of the Third Reich and, in fact, which ultimately led to the democracy, straight line. And you might add, and I'm going to have to go ahead and talk a little bit about who, who's Robert Jackson? Robert Jackson, Brief Reader's Digest, bio. He was born in 1892 in Warren County, Pennsylvania, which is just in the northwest part of Pennsylvania. He came over to my neck of the woods in Frewsburg, New York, which is in the southwest portion of New York. Went to uh, high school, or went to high school there, graduated, valedictorian. Valedictorian in a class of seven. <laughs> you don't have to go into that part when you're giving your bio. It's a valedictorian, it's a valedictorian. <laughs> then he did one year of high school in, where I live in Jamestown, New York, which was the big city in that area. And that's where he really developed his interest and love for the law, readings, classic readings, uh, debate. It, that was it because he never went to college. Never went to college, never graduated from law school, having attended only one year at Albany Law School. He read for the law, which you could do. He did. Passed the, law, passed the bar at the earliest age possible, age 21. Practiced law very successfully in our area for 20 years, dealing with, could be from union members, could corporations. He also was very much involved in politics, not as an office runner, but sort of a backroom guy, as a Democrat in a county which was loaded with Republicans. He was, stood out. And, but very successful lawyer. And as such, he befriended a guy from Dutchess County who was the state senator named Frank Roosevelt. And through that connection and through that contact, there's this buddy, Frank Roosevelt, who subsequently became a governor of the state of New York and then, as you know, president. In 1934, President Roosevelt reached out to his buddy in Jamestown, New York, to see if he would be interested in coming to be the chief of what we would now know as the Internal Revenue Service, the General Counsel. And he said yes, he would do it for a year and just see how it works out. He went there and he prosecuted, his first case was against a guy named Andrew Mellon, Secretary of Treasury, on a civil tax fraud case. Now if you can imagine your first case was say, hey, why don't you go after this guy named Andrew Mellon? Whoa. And I tell you what, we're going to sue him for civil tax fraud and uh, why don't, we're going to do it in Pittsburgh. So can you imagine trying a case in <laughs> Pittsburgh against Andrew Mellon, which he did, and he did successfully. And the uh, National Art Museum in Washington, when you go in there, there's a big plaque, and it says all of the artwork is, that is 
you've been given here is through the beneficence of one Andrew Mellon. What you don't know is that was the settlement of the civil tax fraud case <laughs> against Andrew Mellon. And when it was dedicated, uh, Robert Jackson was there with President Roosevelt and said, you know, they, Bob, we should probably name this after you because of you and your case. We have all of this artwork. Thank you very much. Uh, then he was going to really come home, but the reality was he stayed on. He became uh, Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Division. He became Assistant Attorney General uh, overall. He became Solicitor General. And then he became the uh, Attorney General. And then soon he became the answer to a recent Jeopardy question for those people who are Jeopardy question fans. You know, name the only person in the history of the United States who was a Solicitor General, Attorney General, and a Justice of the Supreme Court. And, and you could say, who was Robert H. Jackson? That's the only question I think I've ever known on Jeopardy. <laughs> Bingo. So I was so pleased to know that answer. And it was the final Jeopardy question. So the guy actually uh, went on because of that, because one guy actually got it right. Um, Jackson was on the Supreme Court from 1941 to 1954, and he died in 1954 as a member of the Supreme Court. One of his law clerks was a guy named William Rehnquist, and one of Rehnquist's law clerks, just to kind of complete, complete the genealogy, was a guy named John G. Roberts. And so both of them have been to the Jackson Center, tipping their hat to Robert Jackson. But that's not why we're here. That just sets the tone about the fact that what I glossed over in the biography is, in fact, that Jackson in 1945, in the middle of his Supreme Court term, was asked if he would consider taking on this responsibility to conduct the first trial of its kind against individuals who were responsible for war crimes. And so President Roosevelt had Jackson in mind, and when you start looking at your QR cards, you'll get to see a speech that Jackson gave in April where he talks about the importance, as the war was winding down, that there in fact be a record so that this never is repeated again. And so he argued against some of the Roosevelt administration who thought that simply Germany should be removed of all of its industry, become an agrarian state, and that was a very popular uh, opinion with one of the high-ranking uh, officials, and I won't name his name, uh, but instead that was given in April. Roosevelt dies in April. Truman is then uh, sworn in. The general counsel for Roosevelt stays on as general counsel for Truman, and Roosevelt, or excuse me, Truman then reaches out to Jackson to see if he's interested. He convinced Jackson that to do that, to leave the court, but not to resign. And the reason he did, Truman said, hey, I've checked out everything, and there is, in fact, all this evidence. All this evidence is already prepared. You have to just kind of parachute in start the trial someplace in Germany, and you should be back soon so that you will not miss much of the Supreme Court. Uh, it was sold a bill of goods. <laughs> in fact, there was no evidence. Uh, and that's where there was mention of Harold Deutsch gathering evidence with, uh, Colonel, or with, John, with Donovan, and that became part of the OSS's uh, responsibility to gather the evidence, and that was going on at the same time, while Harold Deutsch is out getting uh, interviews with Yodel and Keitel and Warlamont and others, uh, Jackson had to figure out whether there was going to be a trial, where the trial was going to be, and against whom. So one of the most important things that Jackson accomplished in 1945 was, in fact, the negotiation of something not often talked about is the London Agreement, which was the treaty among the Russians, a treaty which included the French, the British, and the United States. Why was that of concern? Because the Russian jurisprudence was pretty simple. If you're indicted, you're presumed guilty. Simple. And we're going to have a trial because we're going to figure out what the penalty is going to be. 
And that's the Russian way of doing things. The French has a civil law system for you, all you lawyers here. I won't try to describe it because I will fail, uh, but it's different. And then there is our, with the British, common law English system. Three sets of unique, different jurisprudences, so they had to negotiate. What's going to be the, the playing field? What's it going to look like? What are the rights of the defendants? Will there be cross-examination? Will there be counsel? Will there be those protections which we would normally expect in our system weren't necessarily available in those other systems? And in fact, it got pretty ugly. The actual proceedings went on for some time. Jackson got very frustrated. The Russians got frustrated with Jackson to the point that Jackson had to go to Potsdam and there meet with President Truman to say, hey, these Russians, they're tough. These Russians, we're not getting anywhere. We'll never get to a trial and I'll be here forever. Do you mind if I simply use my discretion? Do I need to have to check with you to cut deals. And Truman said, no, you're, you're on your own. In fact, you got the authorization to sign the treaty. So what happened was back, back to the table they went and finally Jackson looked the Russians in the eyes and said, enough, enough is enough. You know, if you don't want to work with the British, the French, and us, uh, that's okay. We're going to go alone without you because we don't need you. We simply don't need you. You don't have the goods. What's that? Virtually all of the defendants were under the control of the Americans in the American zone. For those that were in the ash can, those that were uh, being interviewed by Harold Deutsch, among others, we had in custody. The British had Hess, who, you know the Hess story, that's a whole hour. Um, and the Russians had and could only offer up Eric Rader and uh, Hans Fritschi. So they basically threatened to say, we're going to move along without you. Uh, there's a song way back when, got along without you before we met you, going to get along without you now. And I think that was kind of what, I don't know, maybe that was the Beatles, I don't know. Uh, so that was the concept, and all of a sudden the Russians capitulated. All of a sudden, on August 8th, 1945, an agreement was signed by Jackson. Now, what I find fascinating, and, and really, it's the template. It's that document. It's worth reading, because everything you learn about the Nuremberg trial was laid out in those documents. Uh, and it was, the treaty was signed in the United States by the United States by Robert Jackson. Here's a guy who never went to college, never graduated from law school, from my neck of the woods, who had the authority to sign on behalf of the United States. Personally, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Now, that's August. Now, Jackson had to put together, how many lawyers do we have here? Think about this. They admit it? <laughs> I'm proud of you guys. I don't care about these colonels. <laughs> My man. Here we go. Uh, so, August 8th, the London Agreement. In that time where they actually put, laid out the procedures for the case, until they started is November 20th. Think about that. Think about pulling together a case not against one defendant, but against 24 defendants and six organizations. A monumental task. Plus they had to determine where it was going to be. And Nuremberg was the choice. Uh, and there's a reasons for that. One, symbolically, that's where the Nuremberg rallies were, as I mentioned earlier. Two, that was also, they had a courthouse. And three, in a very mystical way, the First Reich and the Second Reich all kind of worked their way through Nuremberg as well. So that was the logic of why they had a Nuremberg. But the courthouse, though pretty much intact, they had to pull it all together. So they did so. And so on November 20th, uh, they actually commenced the proceeding after having a one day uh, earlier show to a placate the Russians. The Russians wanted to have the trial in Berlin. So part of the deal that was cut was saying, all right, fantastic. We'll go to Berlin for one day and we'll read the indictments in Berlin. You win, you Russians. <laughs> the rest of the trial will play, do, go to Nuremberg and that's what exactly what happened. So the trial starts on November 21st, 
November, November 20th was when they read the indictments. Jackson gives the opening statement on November 21st, which in fact was probably one of the foremost pieces of English literature and laid out the explanation for the four counts and why in fact they were trying these individuals for crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, crimes against war, and in the conspiracy trial. And it was magical. Even to this day, it is quoted over and over and over again by the prosecutors at the subsequent tribunals. That started the case in November 21st, 1945. And throughout this time period, cases were presented against, as it turned out, only 22. Uh, one was dropped from the, uh, the case, that was the, Mr. Krupp, he was just too old, feeble to actually have that trial. One committed suicide by the name of Robert Lay. And one, so there's 22, 21, when you see the pictures, you'll actually count them up, there was 21. The 22nd was Martin Borman, who was tried in absentia. So the trial is conducted. Jackson is the chief American prosecutor. There were chief prosecutors of Russia, Roman Radenko. There was a chief uh, prosecutor for France, I uh, can't pronounce his name, Dementhan, and the chief prosecutor for Britain, which was uh, Sir Hartley Shawcross, um, who soon left, and his Mac David Maxwell Fife really took, took the heavy oar on that one. The trial lasted until uh, the actual date of sentencing and judgment, which was September 30th, 1946. And the actual judgment at Nuremberg was October 1st, 1946, of which there were three acquittals, three acquittals. Uh, von Papen, Schacht, and Fritschi were acquitted. And then there were, the rest were found guilty. Twelve were uh, sentenced to be hanged, and eleven were actually hanged. Uh, a guy named Gehring cheated the hangman and decided to s swallow a cyanide pill. Had its own drama there. And the rest of them were given various prison sentences. The last of which was Rudolf Hess, who in prison at Spandau, ultimately was uh, deemed to have committed suicide. Another whole story unto itself. Um, and there's so many wonderful, interesting, intriguing stories that came in and around the Nuremberg trial and the various sentencing. Part of what Colonel Patton wanted me to talk about is talk about the legacy of that trial. That trial, which was an ad hoc trial, it was a trial by treaty treaty among nations who were the winners, who were the winners. And they had to have a, they had a trial. It was based on uh, certain treaties that had been previously created, uh, the Bri Kellogg-Briand Treaty, the Moscow Treaty, um, and there was a Hague Treaty. And that was the creation and the basis for it. But it was the first trial the first trial in history where, in fact, individuals were held accountable, not the government. It wasn't a conviction against Germany. It wasn't against Italy. It wasn't anybody else. It was against individuals. And that was the first time that happened. Thereafter, at Nuremberg, there were 12 subsequent Nuremberg trials. These were trials of which Robert Jackson assigned Telford Taylor to be the chief American prosecutor at those trials. It's important to note that the defendants at the first trial, the International Military Tribunal, the Jackson trial, this is Gehring and Hess, Ribbentrop, Keitel, Yodel, et al., were really the policy makers, the implementers, the guys that signed the orders. I think it's almost fair to say that probably none of them actually killed anybody. But they signed orders which ultimately led to a terrific amount of carnage. The subsequent trials were against those groups, 
who were part of the implementation of the policy. This was the, anybody see the movie Judgment at Nuremberg? Usually the question I get at the end of every presentation is, Greg, Greg, who played Robert Jackson in Judgment at Nuremberg? <laughs> Great question. And the answer is, I won't let you go through the normal crowd saying, well, it's Spencer Tracy, it's, you know, uh, Richard Widmark, it's all those guys. None of them. Nobody played Jackson because that movie, Judgment at Nuremberg, though it nicely has the name Nuremberg, as nicely has the judgment, is a fact based on one of the subsequent trials against the judges who corrupted the laws of the Nazi regime. They took the law, the rule of law, and corrupted it and applied it using then the political ideology of Adolf Hitler. Just had a wonderful symposium at the Jackson Center, five hours just on that subject alone. One of the other trials was a trial against the doctors. These are the folks who tried, or these are the folks who actually conducted the experiments. Things you learned about the legacy of Jackson's trial is that trial, at the judgment of the doctor's trial, was in fact they had to lay out the conditions and the elements of which they had to prove to see if there was a violation of some law. So the judges laid out, and I think it's eight, I might be wrong, actual bullet points that said what's required for a physician to take advantage of and to uh, conduct experiments on an individual. That they have to explain what it is that's going to happen. They have to explain what the possible risks are. They have to explain and get their consent, essentially informed consent. I don't know if there's any doctors here. Uh, and then when you go in today for an elective surgery, Guess what? They hand you a piece of paper. After they've explained a little bit about what's going to happen, here's the upside, here's the downside, sign a piece of paper that you have been informed, informed consent. The basis for that is the Nuremberg judgment in the doctor's trial. Who knew? Yet we've had at the Jackson Center, the president of the AMA and others come in and talk about the medical ethics is in fact a direct relationship of that process. One of the other trials, in fact, there are many, three of them were against the uh, uh, industrialists. You had uh, Krupp, you had Farben, you had Flick. And we're pleased to have in our presence today the son of the judge in that Flick trial. We have Bill Christensen here, and his dad, William Christensen, from Minnesota, was in fact a judge at that subsequent Flick trial. And thank you for coming. This is terrific that you're here. And we had a, the pleasure early at 6 o'clock to interview him as he too was at Nuremberg, uh, there being part of his, the family as they, I don't want to say enjoying the Nuremberg trial, but they were there. One of the other trials, and the last one, was the trial against the ministers, the ministries case, case number 11. And in this case, again, Mr. Christensen, uh, your dad, grand, grandfather, was in fact the presiding judge. He was the number one judge there. And that was the last trial in Nuremberg. It was the longest, and it was against those folks who were right below Ribbentrop in the, in the, in the ministry's department. Those people who were the head of the uh, uh, secret, it's the CIA of what they had there within the Nazis, uh, Schellenberg and others. So, and people that I'm sure that uh, Harold Deutsch in his interviews came across their names. So again, there's a wonderful Minnesota connect to, in fact, those subsequent Nuremberg trials. And in fact, it was the minister's trial that was one of the first ones to have the actual definition of the, the war, uh, crimes of aggression as one of the evidence and one of the findings. That's an important part because I will soon segue into the International Criminal Court 
which in fact is currently discussing what the definition of the crimes of aggression are, and yet Mr. Christensen's dad was intimately involved in really the first outside of Jackson's trial to actually decide that. So that happened at Nuremberg, all at Nuremberg. Not much has been written about the subsequent Nuremberg trials, though I know Mr. Basler, who you had here last year, is in fact one of the experts on that. What happened thereafter? What happened to Jackson's dream? What happened to the Nuremberg principles, which in fact got embodied in the United Nations in 1948? Those principles were adopted. It's called the Nuremberg Principles by the United Nations, as was the Genocide Convention, as was other things relating to coming that came out of the Nuremberg trial right after the uh, war and as a direct result so that there would be an embodiment of the concept of the rule of law as opposed to the rule of intimidation and the rule of the gun. Cold War enters. The Cold War enters as we... we World War II vets would know, certainly after we come home. Next thing you know, the bad guys, yeah, they were the Germans. We just had them. But all of a sudden, you're reading about <coughs> Stalin, the Russians, and our whole world changes there. In fact, it was impacted by the subsequent Nuremberg trials where, in fact, uh, I think it's like 144 defendants were actually found guilty, given various terms, including hanged, to be hanged. And all of a sudden, they all got commuted. What? These guys committed war crimes, and their sentences were commuted. People were released. It impacted the judges, Judge Christensen, impacted the prosecutors, who I'd interview. I've interviewed many of them. I uh, wish they were with us today so they could sit and tell them themselves. And the reason was the focus was now on Russia, the Cold War. And that Cold War stopped everything. A lot of bad things were happening. In Russia, a lot of bad things were happening throughout. And there was no prosecutions. The State Department, everybody else got, it was just simply Russia and the United States. Until all of a sudden, 1991, Gorbachev, things changed. The Soviet Union cracks, falls apart. And then there is a couple of incidences, one in Bosnia, Herzegovina, which there's some serious, serious bad things happening under the uh, leadership of Milosevic, Mladic, Karadzic, and at the same time, some very bad things occurring in Rwanda. Very bad things. And all of a sudden, the United Nations woke up. And in 1994, they created International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia, International Criminal Tribunals in Rwanda, ad hoc tribunals for the first time since Nuremberg to, in fact, identify and try those individuals who are the most responsible for crimes against humanity. Enter the Nuremberg concept. Enter the London Agreement. Enter all of those things which, in fact, were important. Enter the fact that, because I know I, we've interviewed those chief prosecutors, they would lead with Jackson's opening statement that that connect occurred. And then there was trials in Sierra Leone. Think Blood Diamonds. Think Charles Taylor. And then they had tribunals, and still are. All these are still going on in Cambodia, Pol Pot, Lebanon. There's political intrigue there, and they took out individuals. Uh, which ultimately rolled around into the Rome Treaty of 1998, which was signed by many countries, not the United States. Uh, and that then created the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court started in 2003, and its current prosecutor is Fatu Bensouda. Remember I started this conversation, I was kind of hoping I'd finally get back to the beginning. Uh, I think I am. So uh, where I was in Nuremberg, a location where they're very proud today, Nuremberg, Germany, because they have a Nuremberg Academy, which in fact has individuals throughout the world to advance the rule of law. And it's one of the high-end academic opportunities that we have in the world today. In addition, they give out a human rights award for the, the foremost international criminal law person. They're very proud 
of that. They're very proud of the fact that they were one of the first members of the International Criminal Court. In fact, they voted unanimously in the Reichstag to join the International Criminal Court. When you think about that, in 1945 to all of a sudden, 60 years later, that country has done remarkable things. And at the same time, I'm there in September 30th in the, that same courtroom where the trials occurred, the same courtroom where Robert Jackson gave the opening statement, the same courtroom where Bill Christensen's dad presided and Bill was actually in the audience to be a participant there. Uh, in that same courtroom, there was the attorney general, our top law enforcement officer there to talk about the United States commitment to the rule of law and how the rule of law is so significant and how the Nuremberg trial and Robert Jackson and that legacy that's playing out today in so many fronts, followed by Fatou Ben Souda, who in fact was the head of the International Criminal Court and what the hope for, believe me, it's a work in progress. There is no uh, you know, silver bullet in all of this, but the hope and the prayer is that the Nuremberg trial will have, would have created and has created principles of personal accountability such that it could act, and we hope it does act, as a deterrent to individuals who want to perpetrate crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, and so that even today when you talk about all the crimes that are going on in Syria, I know that behind all that there is a whole group of lawyers and jurists involved in gathering the evidence. So when that day permits and they have uh, al-Bashir in custody, that in fact a war crimes trial, and he knows that, he's very much aware that this is all happening. So hence that's all part of the Nuremberg legacy, the Nuremberg trial, which in fact was the bookend of the World War II, and that bookend of the World War II is why we're here at the Harold Deutsch lecture. Because the, as I read the mission statement here of the Harold C. Deutsch World War II uh, roundtable, it's whereas the World War II was one of the most important events of the 20th century, and whereas World War II politically, socially, and scientifically shaped the post-war period of history, we feel it is important to promote the study of and preserve the factual history of World War II. I want to thank Colonel Patton, and I want to thank all the participants of the roundtable for inviting me back, uh, and to have a chance to really talk about the factual aspects of what happened at the end of World War II, and most importantly, its legacy today as we are living in our wonderful democracy. So thank you very much. We, we have a bonus. This is uh, Bill Christensen. Just a, a little bit of, of background. Again, as I mentioned, uh, Judge Christensen was a judge here in Minnesota. Uh, he was asked in 1947 if he would be willing to participate in this wonderful experiment. So, Bill, maybe you can give us a little bit of background on why your dad perhaps decided to be involved in the subsequent Nuremberg trial. Um, well, he was asked um, to do that. He was uh, an associate judge in Frederick Flick, which was uh, probably considered the richest uh, man in Germany. He had a l large interest in uh, factories, and he also had a large interest in Mercedes-Benz. And um, after that trial was over, um, uh, they asked him and to do the last one, and he was a presiding judge in that, and that was the ministry's case. All the people, uh, like in, in the United States, it would be all of the people below the top people, like the Secretary of State and other people, and an SS G General and Walter Schellenberg, who was really part of their spy agency. So then that took a long time, and... Um, then they spent five months when that was over with just putting together a uh, verdict and a judgment. And our main speaker told me that is the longest judgment 
a verdict, you say, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it was uh, 830, 899 pages, if you can I just imagine. I want to use a newspaper. Yeah. Uh, so you didn't, nobody wanted to read that one. No. And no. I, perhaps uh, I know you've had, uh, you, during the course of the interview, your dad being involved in there. Perhaps you can give a little personal remembrance of yourself. You were uh, in sixth and seventh grade during that time period living in Nuremberg. A little bit about what Nuremberg was like. Well, um, after the um, war finally got going and school started in uh, February of 19, well, in November of 1946 and 47, so a North Central accreditation, you have to go a whole year. So I went to school the first year till the 11th of July. But basically, Nuremberg was, you'd say in German, a la caput. The main town itself, the British decided to basically carpet bomb it at night, and they destroyed the, the wall city part of it, most of it, and you can look around and not see a building standing. The rest of the area uh, was, it's a large place, it's probably about the size of Minneapolis or St. Paul, so there's all kinds of it that stood, and then of course the Zeppelin plots or where Hitler's rallies were, that's still there. And the Germans are having these questions about do we want to rip it down? And I don't think that's a bright idea. They should remember uh, what was going on there. Now, of all of the trials I got to go to, my dad said, well, you can go to all of these except the doctor's case because of all those atrocities. He says, that's off limits. You can't go to that. Um, many interesting people uh, just commenting my dad when he was going to Germany. Uh, he went to Fort Hamilton and uh, spent two days with Mickey Marcus, if you remember, a Jewish lawyer who actually then ended up in Israel helping put together a, a ragtag army. And he got killed by his own sentry and then Count Falk Bernadette and then a guy named Lemkin who actually uh, came out with a book about the war crimes documenting those of the Nazis and the Germans right after the war. So um, I would say, um, you know, my dad's th take on it um, was this. There's a couple of statements I just want you to know about Minnesota. I'm from Red Wing, Minnesota, and uh, the first uh, commander of NATO, General Loris Norstead, uh, is from there, and then Eugenie Anderson, who started out as being in charge of, uh, we didn't have an ambassador to Bulgaria, and they tried to isolate her from the people to going out in the community, wanted to quarantine her. She just ignored them and put on a, a real pro-American face, and then later she was appointed by Harry Truman as the ambassador to Denmark. Well, anyway, my dad grew up in, uh, um, South Dakota, went to law, was in the Navy in World War I, got out of the Navy and went to law school at the University of Chicago. And then he uh, came to uh, Red Wing, came to Minnesota and worked, and then he opened practice in uh, Red Wing. So uh, this is just a couple of interesting quotes, to, you know, and you say, well, uh, what does this all mean? My, here's a, a quote. It was the small town in Minnesota, rather than the glittering capital of Berlin, that proved to embody the conscience of mankind from the Kansas City Star. And if you really sum it up, what my, my dad's belief was, you know, Nazis, nobody stopped the Nazis. Everybody acquiesced in Hitler. And when they finally got to the point, it was too late. And that's how he got power. So um, they asked questions about people's involvement and what was going on. And here's an example for us all today, too. Here's what my dad said. The failure of these men, and those were the leaders, the failures of these men to remain steadfast to principles of duty and love for their fellow countrymen, many of whom doubtlessly relied on their leadership, illustrates graphically for everyone how unstable and undependable even brilliant and talented men can be when lacking a solid moral foundation and a proper sense of duty. 
And I think that really summed it all up. And of course, it was uh, something, you know, when we're talking about these principles and how they've evolved today. And of course, the, the U.S. doesn't hasn't signed the tr Treaty of uh, of Rome. They haven't signed a few other treaties. Uh, Kyoto, if you want to talk about global warming, or the Antiquities Act, which is to prevent uh, and preserve in. Uh, uh, cultural sites around the world. People in Minnesota have actually been involved in that. You know, they, you have a red cross on the roof, and this one you have a blue type of an emblem on it, so that people um, are supposed to not bomb or destroy that. So we we still have a ways to go, and of course, part of this is. Um, with some of these war crimes that are going on, well, why weren't the Russians tried? Well, um, you'd had to start World War III to to uh, to get them to the justice. So there there are working on it, but I, you know, this lecture was about all of the positive things that are in place and doing things today. And I just got a little today. I, I got a um, little uh, note from St. Olaf College that they have their Friedrich Nansen Institute for Rural Peace uh, and uh, trying to do peacemaking. And the director of that was over at St. Olaf talking about it. And we also have the genocide project at William Mitchell. So we have a lot of things. And then we have the, the situation about uh, the, the the other group about the torture. So Minnesota is really doing a lot of things and bringing that to the front. So I think Minnesota can be proud that uh, in working on this and uh, uh, Harold Deutsch papers and is a kind of uh, his, his influence. So um, I think Minnesota can be proud and everybody's remembering this. And you got to understand in Germany when I was a kid, Okay, besides Alice's Caput, there were no Nazis in Germany. Did you know that? There was no Nazis. No one knew it. And it's the same people who said, ask him who you voted for, and there's one guy, they don't want to admit it. But, some, but he won the election, so we know there's some Trump followers. And I'm not trying to be smart about Trump, but I'm just talking about uh, you have a choice, and, 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 and it's a free country. And but um, you have to exercise uh, and keep after these things because if you don't, and in remembrance, now I think the Germans are doing a much better job of talking about it in, in the generation. And I will give you one example. Okay, I'm a kid. I'm 11 years old, and I'm in a theater in Nuremberg. And the U.S. military invited all of the leaders to come to this theater. Okay, and you sit there for two hours watching war crimes atrocity films. So we got the Nuremberg trials going on. How many Germans went to it? Probably not very many at all of the average person. So they did that so they could get it through. The British and other Americans take, took people out from their villages. They didn't know what was going on. They never knew what was going on, and they marched them out there. And you see these pictures of British Tommies with um, you, you know, you know ga mask over their face and bulldozers. So they finally tried to get some of that across. So now we have m m museums, m memorials in Berlin and other places. So they are uh, aware of that. But for many years, I think that was just not talked about in Germany whatsoever. But now the Germans are uh, cognizant of that, and they're very interested in the, the defense of the Constitution in Germany. That's Im important to them, and they're very concerned about um, civil rights in Germany. I'm going to come into the audience. Questions in the audience. Right here. Could you address the uh, defense counsel for the defendants? Sure. Uh, every defendant, German defendant, had assigned to it by the court, unless they had their own somebody involved. One of the interesting aspects of the fight, right, they all have right to counsel, if they actually knew somebody who might even have been a Nazi, who might have actually been a, on a list for a war criminal, the, the uh, actual defense counsel was given immunity, 
and uh, they, they came, the Americans paid for them, so they, uh, everybody had the, the right to counsel, and they had counsel. Nobody went pro se, nobody went by themselves, but yeah, they were all represented. Let me see how we can do this. I just want to comment. My father had a very high regard for the uh, German lawyers that were really very, very competent. And he, one guy he talked to was Robert Servatius, uh, who was an artillery officer, and he talked about being in Russia and also uh, Operation Sea Lion, where the Germans were thinking about invading England but didn't pull off. And Servatius was a person that was hired by Adolf Eichmann to represent him. Thank you. Like a Martian. Was this a, a, an actual trial with a, with a jury? And who were they? Uh, the answer was no. They were judges. Each country had a, a judge assigned to it. And... Anyways, each, each country had to such. So there was a one chief judge from America, Britain, Russia, and the, and the United States. The United States judge was Francis Biddle. The chief judge overall was John Lawrence. Each country also had an alternate judge. So when you look up and you see a picture, you'll see eight judges. But th those are the ones that made the decision. I'll come around. Can you just stand up? Uh, sure. Uh, you have uh, trials for Germany and you have trials for Japan. Were there anything? No. Why not? The question, the question, I'm sorry, the question was why wasn't there war crimes trial for Italy? Um, I just, the two focus was since Italy had signed an armistice with the United States, uh, and I think the real practical aspect, Mussolini, who was had been the chief architect, had died. I mean, he'd been strung up as we all know. So there was an armistice signed, which in fact, I think within the tr treaty itself uh, with the United States, because they got out early, Italy got out early, that in fact, I think that was part of the fact of the lack of interest. I don't want to say they, they waived it, but the lack of interest in prosecution. Germany was first, and then of course that in the Pacific was, was Japan. Yeah. Just going on, man, it was Alan Dulles and the secret surrender in Carl Wolf. So that somebody got immunity so we could keep quelling America. Well, actually, what happened in Italy is Alan Dulles and the OSS, they made a secret agreement. And the uh, Carl Wolf, who was at Nuremberg, uh, SS general, he agreed to surrender forces in Italy. And uh, Dulles had worked uh, on this. And if you know, the fighting in Italy was uh, uh, mountain to mountain, 10th Mountain Division. There's a lot of graves in Petromala in Italy, and uh, that's where uh, Robert Dole got wounded and spent many years, a couple of years in a hospital. So that, that was, we're going to end this here. And a lot of the Italians, of course, weren't, uh, they were sort of dragged into the war. Uh, l l l let me ask a question uh, with what Bill. After World War II, the, uh, the Germans had a denazification. They couldn't teach or talk about the, the Nazi heritage for many years. Uh, d do you think that influenced your, your comment about the, the lack of knowledge of the German people of, of the, the events of World War II? I don't know. I think he was I, my my impression of what he said. I don't want to say you can speak for yourself. Trust me. Uh, I think it was a little tongue in cheek uh, about the lack of German knowledge of it all. No, no I, I understood that. Yeah, okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I, I I don't know you what what to say about that, but I just think that that, that was an era that you'd want to end it, and most Germans, if you ask them, as I I'm not trying to be facetious. Uh, how Hitler got elected, because they, most people claim they were never a member of the Nazi party, which is hard to believe. I understand. Okay, uh, some questions here? Yeah. 
How much did the trials cost and who footed the bill? I don't know the actual number, but the United States. It was a huge, huge amount. Uh, the, the, the Russians, the British, the French just it had no money to do this. So uh, the United States underwrote it. Most of the attorneys who were there were the United States. It was, it was the United States enterprise uh, with representation, but he, he, all of the staffs, the British, the French, and the Russian were very small. Um, and so, yeah, it was very much our trial. Did you ever show the film clips of his opening statement? Oh, yeah. It's very eloquent. Do you have that? Yeah. With you? Uh, yeah, Probably in my, on my iPad. I mean, do you, you project it for people when you lecture? Oh, yeah. yeah. Because it's really an eloquent, eloquent yeah. statement. I, I knew we had a short time period, so I didn't want to get too much into the film today. What, what happened to the four people that were acquitted during the first <laughs> part of the Nuremberg trials? Where's my good friend? Uh, uh, Axel. Um, there's three people acquitted, uh, Fritchie, Von Poppen, and um, Schacht. Uh, you'll see newsreels to that effect where they didn't know what they were doing. So uh, the, you can imagine during the October 1st, 1946, they're reading out the judgments, the sentences were going to come after lunch. So it was just judgments, either guilty or not guilty. So they just went through a series, Gary, guilty, Hess, guilty. They went through all the four counts. And all of a sudden, it comes to shock, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And it, there was a sort of shock. Uh, then the same thing with Fritchie and the same thing with Von Poppen. It's great newsreels, because I put together all of the film. That, we've got all the film of the trial. And as that particular session ended, uh, the three sort of huddled around. The other ones who came over uh, who'd been found guilty shake their hands. Those three guys didn't know what, what the hell to do. Uh, they could go free. And the next thing you know, there's a news conference. The three of them are at a news conference eating chocolate bars and smoking cigarettes. And everybody's asking them questions. How do you feel? How do you feel? Great, great, great. I didn't think I'd be convicted. Well, then they said, you can go. You can walk out of the courtroom. Have at it. Where did they go? Well, that's the point. They didn't. They walked. They, they knew that. Uh, Jurisdiction was in the hands of the Germans then, so uh, they were waiting for those three guys. They'd read all the testimony. Uh, and so they actually asked and petitioned the court to not be released. So they actually stayed in the prison for seven days until each of them could find a way to sneak out the back door and go someplace. Subsequently, they were tried by German courts and subsequently found guilty and sentenced. and. Uh, I'm looking for Axel uh, right there. So okay, why don't you draw closure to that, because you actually did research on the, I think, the post Nuremberg on those three guys? I didn't do any serious research, but as a kid, I regularly, this was in 1950, 51, 52, I regularly walked past the prison where this friction was kept on my way to school. So I'm not quite sure when they were released, but it was, as of 52, they were also in prison. Yeah, Von Poppen and Schock were pretty old at the time, so they just died natural. They, they were committed and then released and then died in the 50s. Fritchie was a little younger and probably shouldn't have been at the Nuremberg trial anyways. He was just a, he was a propagandist. They didn't have Goebbels because he had committed suicide, so they put in Fritchie. Question here. Yeah. Can, uh, have the winners of any war been held accountable for crimes against humanity or war crimes? Or is it only the losers that get prosecuted? Well, that's a, that's a good question. At this point in time, the International Criminal Court, they don't have winners and losers. Uh, so you can bring a complaint against anybody if there is a, a violation of crimes against humanity, violation of crimes of peace. The war crimes aggression is currently uh, being the, de the elements of the war of crimes of aggression, which was part of Jackson's uh, determination and part of uh, the ministry's case of which Bill Christensen's dad was a part of. Uh, right now, it's not a definition. Anyways, you, that's all you have to do is have somebody have a complaint against you from another member country if you're a member of the International Criminal Court. Now, we know some countries are not, Israel, the United States, and uh, other, there's a few others. Question here. I've heard criticism of Justice Jackson as a prosecutor at Nuremberg, and 
at least a perception that uh, after his examination of Herman Goering, that uh, Goering could have walked out of the courtroom a, a free man uh, because he basically allowed Goering to uh, run rings around him. Is there any truth to that? Well, the, there was um, the answer some of it. And first of all, the evidence was so overwhelming, Goering was never going to walk out. I mean, he was, he was buried, and it was just the evidence was there. But the highlight, the big marquee event of the Nuremberg trial in 1946 was going to be where Robert Jackson, who had not, he was not there on the courtroom all the time. He was the, basically the administrator, but the chief American prosecutor was going to cross-examine the chief defendant. Everybody showed up. The place was packed like tonight. Walter Cronkite, among others, were all there. And it was a three-day cross-examination. And I have actually had the chance to interview uh, the number two man, the guy who had sat there while Jackson was at the podium, Whitney Harris. And the first day, uh, Jackson was used to, in the American system, just good old all-American cross-examination, where you ask a question, the answer is yes or no. Yes or no, yes or no. Well, what happened was, Gehring said, yes, but let me explain. In, in our world, that doesn't happen. You can't do that. So that, and then Jackson would seek a ruling from Chief Judge Lawrence, and Lawrence said, ah, let it go, ah, let it go. And Jackson really got frustrated, because he kept never really directly, he would answer the question, yeah, you're right, but, 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 but. And this is cross-examination. So Jackson lost his temper. He, he lost it. He lost it on the judge. Bad move. And that was reported everywhere. Jackson loses temper in cross-examination against Gehring. Gehring runs wild. Jackson didn't let Gehring run wild. It was the court. Uh, yeah, Bill. OK. In uh, Minnesota, we have a very fine uh, guy named Joe Freeberg, who represents just about everybody, and he's very successful in re defending people. But he has been at this theme all the time is, this is the worst example of cross-examination in the history of mankind, and every time you go to a bar symposium, Joe trots that out. But here's the deal at Nuremberg, forgetting all that aside, that's his example. There, the thing about this was Nuremberg and the end. They had so much captured uh, things. Okay, Herr Obergruppenführer, uh, I'm going to show you this document. Is that your signature, ordering somebody to get deported? And they can't say no. So there, whatever it was, Herman Goering may have got. The, it was letting somebody. Uh, grandstand, and he and he did, but I d don't think that that jeopardized anything because there was so much overwhelming evidence. But anyway, Joe is probably going to wonder why I criticize him, but that's his his main theme, and he keeps repeating it. But he's a very successful lawyer, but he should have a new topic. <laughs> uh, question here. Look, that's a. I like that. <laughs> It's my understanding that the defendants, part of their defense was that they, because the laws in Germany had been changed, they were just following the law. So how did the prosecution handle that? And, and was it, were the trials, were there um, interpreters? Was there you know, German, English, French? And, and then did many of these Nazis, as they say, go to South America? And how did they get there? Wow. All right, that's, that's uh, procedurally, all of the trial was conducted in multiple languages, Russian, French, English, and you could actually dial up and have the headphones on so everybody could hear. There were translators in the booth. That, that was that. Uh, with regards to the uh, defendants, uh, uh, they all, I forget the second question, but uh, Oh, superior orders. Superior orders was the, really the question. They were just following, following orders. That within the actual London agreement itself, they dealt with that issue of, gee, just following orders. 
uh, military folks all over the place here, you're just following orders. But at some point, there is that point where uh, you got to let your conscience be your guide. And in fact, in, written into the London Agreement was, in fact, the superior orders is not a defense. It's not a defense. It's a mitigation. If they were of, following German law, because they had changed the German laws that Jews were not. And they were following, they were following here, basically the. Yeah, and these, these uh, uh, the laws that were tried were, in fact, based upon treaties uh, that Germany had signed. And you can't, there's the Kellogg-Briand Treaty, the Hague Treaty. Uh, World War I. For, there's a postscript of World War I, that's correct, which Germany was uh, signatories to. And the mere fact that subsequently the Reichstag under emergency orders basically gave the right to create laws through the executive, Adolf Hitler, where Hitler said it, it is, therefore it's law. And if therefore it's law and you're following it, therefore aren't you, uh, aren't you following the legal aspects of German law? That's correct. This was international law. Okay, one and last as far point. As, just quickly and also, uh, many Nazis did in fact, who were war cr criminals, Eichmann being among them, Mengele, they did find their way to places like Argentina and Brazil. Watch the movie Boys of Brazil. One last question here. Uh, sir, three simple questions. Spandau Prison, was that located in the Russian sector? Uh, Spandau was in the Russian sector in, in Berlin. Rudolf Hess was the last inmate in that? That's correct. Okay. I had heard and read that when they tore down Spandau, they ground up every brick and deposited it in a lake so there would be no souvenirs. Is that correct? That I don't do not know, but I. Well, I, I think Span, Spandau was in the Br Spandau was in the British sector, and after they ripped it down, they built a commissary. That's my understanding. Yeah. Um, the certainly they ripped it down, and and when let me just for for giggles the uh, Rudolf Hess story, uh, he was found at a time. He was hanged. They, they, they thought he was hanged. They gave the body to the family members. And the family members, wait a minute, this guy's 90 years old. He can hardly get around. How is he going to possibly have the strength and to do that? Which then led to autopsies, which then led to a variety of forensics, which basically concluded that he was garroted. Uh, and the question is, how, where, what, what happened? And during that time period, he was under the guard of the British. And then at all kinds of conspiracies to this day, watch the History Channel, it's, it's great fun. Why would the British do that? Back up uh, on Hess, it's fascinating. Uh, for years, he was just getting older and older, senile, senile, senile. And why they had this huge prison for one person. And every 30 days, the Russians would take over, the, then the British, then the French. The Americans, and I've talked to some of those guards. Now, and, one, one question. Rudolf Hess was the one he flew to Great Britain? Correct. To try to convince C correct. Him correct. A secret, uh, treaty correct. There, right? Yeah, so he was basically out of the war uh, early on, 1940, 41, about the time of uh, uh, Operation Barbarossa. He knew that was coming, and then he just decided he was going to try to cut a peace with the British. Flew over there, parachuted in, arrested, and basically was taken out of the war. And that was a British contribution to the defendants of the Nuremberg trial. Well, anyways, uh, the theory was that uh, all that was going on, they had to, and, and they had petitioned. And the Russians finally, once and for all, had said, we agree. Up until then, the Russians had said no, because it had to require everybody to agree on the release of Hess. The Russians telegraphed, we're, we're going to do this. Two months later, during the British time period, he's all of a sudden commits suicide. And all of a sudden, the autopsy shows a variety of ways which it looked like he was garroted. And the theory and the fun you know, speculation is why, why the, during the British, why would somebody who had access to him actually do that? And the fear factor was that somehow if he got out, he would then spill the beans on his relationship with the British, the same British that he was trying to talk to, the Duke of Hamilton and other things. And it's all great, wonderful conspiracy, and there's not a lot of proof to it, but it's a great Rudolf Hess Nuremberg story.
And if any of you are on um, uh, the uh, American uh, uh, Channel 112 for me, uh, on Comcast, American Heroes Channel, World War II, they frequently play the Nuremberg and a lot of the Nazi. Uh, we're going to end it this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Greg, thank you. Bill, thank you for coming. Thank you, Bill. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn www.round2roundtable.org Production services provided by Barrows Productions. <laughs>